welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Sebastian Malaby, who is director of the Maurice R. Greenberg Center for Geoeconomic Studies and the Paul A. Volcker Senior Fellow for International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. His new book is More Money Than God, Hedge Funds and the Making of a New Elite. Sebastian, welcome to Berkeley. Nice to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born in London, but my raising is a complicated story because my mother's French. Uh, my father was a diplomat, so we spent some time in New York. You can tell that from my accent. Some time in Moscow, uh, some time in Germany, in fact, two or three times in Germany. So it was a bit of a mixture of the product of East-West relations, the Cold War, <laughs> uh, that defined my, my upbringing. And, and uh, looking back, uh, how do you think uh, your parents shaped your thinking about the world? You may have already answered that question, actually. It created a curiosity about the world. I, I was determined not to just live in England all my life. And as it turned out, I've lived in England very little of my life. I've been in the United States now for 15 years, and I lived in Japan before that, and some in Africa as a foreign correspondent in, in Zimbabwe and Southern Africa. So that was the principal focus. It, it, the, the influence of my parents was to make me uh, uh, not a little Englander, but a large Englander. Mm -hmm. And uh, where were you educated? Well, I went to schools in England and I went to Oxford University. And um, as I left Oxford, uh, I uh, had two offers. One was to um, uh, be a, a, a career foreign service official. And the other was to do an internship at The Economist magazine. And I picked the second. And the internship became a permanent position, and uh, that launched me on the career of writing and thinking about the intersections between policy and finance and doing it in an international way. And, and were there any formative experiences earlier that kind of pushed you in this direction, uh, economics slash journalism, or did it just emerge out of your education? Well, um, I'd actually done some economics at high school and then decided I didn't like it and went off and did a modern history degree at Oxford, which was very focused on political philosophy um, and sort of the interaction between political ideas and sort of uh, historical developments in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, but now I've sort of evolved through going to The Economist and learning more about finance kind of on the job, just being thrown into writing about asset management, how insurance works, how banking works. I was in Japan for three years writing about their banking crisis. Uh, and so basically by an education of asking questions, of hanging out with the people who do finance, and just peppering them with questions. If I didn't understand something, I would just say, I didn't get it. Please explain it to me again until I did get it. And so that's how I immersed myself in, in, in finance. And so I, I still retain what I had as a student, which is a fascination with the interaction between ideas uh, and practitioners. And in a way, my book about hedge funds is exactly that. It's, it's, it's really, there's an, a body of academic finance literature, um, most famously the efficient market stuff, but also the derivatives from that, which kind of qualified it. And then there are practitioners who actually work in markets and try to implement some of these ideas. In some mm -hmm. cases, they preempt the ideas. Uh, and it's that mixture of the practical and theoretical, which has always grabbed me. And how long did it take you to write the book? Well, I had the idea for the book in 2006, so well before the financial crisis. Uh, and it took me about three and a half to four years. I mean, partly because getting access to hedge fund managers mm -hmm. is something that people hadn't done before in a major way, with a couple of exceptions. And so persuading people who never gave interviews to give me an interview and to give me, in fact, two or three interviews and to spend lots of time with me with a tape recorder on and then give me their internal documents from their hedge fund. And this was not a simple exercise. So it took about you know, three and a half years of diplomacy of figuring out who did I know who knew the people, who knew the real people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had to be patient in getting the access I needed to really tell the story from the inside out. And uh, I should tell our audience, uh, well, they should go out and buy the book, but the other thing is it this is really a, a history of hedge funds also an evolution of what they were up to over time and we'll talk about that in a minute but you actually uh, said something uh, uh, that uh, I wanted to ask you about because you said uh, uh, you genius does not under always understand itself you said in the book and I'm curious as you did these interviews did 
in addition to telling you the nuts and bolts of what they did, were you left with the impression of that most of these hedge managers understood what they were doing? Well, that quote comes from a bit where I think I invoke Vic Braden, uh, the tennis coach, who uh, did this exercise of asking professional tennis players, what was it that made McEnroe's forehand uh, so effective? And different tennis pros had different theories. McEnroe himself had a theory. And then you could test the theory against the truth by taking a film of the forehand and slowing it down into you know, consecutive frames and seeing really when did he cock that wrist or, wrist or, or, or move his weight slightly. Uh, and what was interesting is that the, the geniuses, the pros, didn't understand. Hmm. They were wrong about what made the forehand so great. And in some of the profiles I write in my book uh, about the history of hedge funds, there are hedge fund managers who posit one theory about why they did well. But when you really dig into the evidence, it's wrong. It just doesn't make sense. And you know, my favorite example of this was Paul Tudor Jones, a sort of storied uh, trend-following macro investor who would invest all over the world in different currencies and commodities and anything he felt like. And he had this idea that he was making money because he was brilliant at looking at historical analogies. So if he thought, well, let's see, the, the S&P 500 has gone up for the last five days, the volume of trading has gone down for the last three days, gold is going this way, the dollar is going that way. Um, and then he would say to his research staff, go find me the six cases in the past when these five conditions have pertained. And then he would look at the pictures that they brought to him and say, OK, so that's how these markets behaved in these past six uh, examples. So I think it's going to do the same thing now. And that's how, that's how he says he made money. But I talked to lots of people who worked for him, including some people who did statistical tests on that proposition. And they found that the value it added, looking at these historical analogies, the value it added was negative, less than zero. He was losing money from this approach. <laughs> uh, and so the real reason he made money was something else. And then it became a kind of intellectual detective exercise uh, to figure out the real reason why these guys uh, made money. Uh, let, let's place uh, for our audience hedge funds in the context. You say uh, at one point, financial markets are mechanisms for matching people who want to avoid risk with people who get paid to take it on. Explain that and how leverage funds fit into that equation. Well, I think it's a great question because you know, there's a lot of skepticism, rather natural skepticism after the financial crisis, that you know, what, what does finance do for anyone? Why, why do we even need all this complex modern financial innovation? Um, and I think it starts with the idea that there always will be financial risk. You know, currencies will go up and down. Interest rates will fluctuate. There'll be difficult decisions to make about should you allocate capital to this biotech company over here or to that software startup over there. And financiers will get it wrong and they'll lose money sometimes. Uh, so there is risk. And the question is, where do you want to have it housed? Right? And my argument in my book is that hedge funds over time have housed it very effectively. They've been better at absorbing this risk uh, and, and really measuring it and being careful about how you manage it than other kinds of financial players. And that's a service to the economy. And if you think about an example of you know, two American companies, one's an exporter, uh, and it's worried that the dollar uh, will get too strong, because then it can't export. And then the other one's an importer, and it's worried that the dollar will get too weak, uh, um, because then its import costs will go up, and its business model will suffer. So these two companies, the exporter and the importer, could manage the risk by each of them holding a separate pool of capital as a buffer. But if every company in the United States did that, there would be enormous reserves of capital sitting in the bank waiting to act as a buffer. The cost of capital would go up because capital would be scarcer. So it's much better if the exporter and the importer meet each other in a futures market for the dollar, and they trade their equal and opposing risk off against each other, and the risk is netted out. But for that transaction to work effectively, you need intermediaries in the middle who are willing to take positions in the dollar. Uh, and, to, and to be specialists in f having a view on where the dollar is going. And that's the role of speculators. And I think the best speculators are to be found at hedge funds. Uh, l let's talk uh, about the tools at work here, because hedge funds short, that's key to what you just described. Uh, they also use leverage. Uh, help us explicate uh, building on the, the model that you just gave. 
Well, so it goes back to the first manager of, of the first hedged fund. Um, he called it a hedged fund. His name was Alfred Winslow Jones. He set it up in 1949. Uh, and he was an interesting character, by the way. I mean, he'd uh, been sent as a young man to uh, Berlin, working for the State Department, uh, and got involved with the anti-Nazi left. He married a German anti-Nazi activist. He, he ran these clandestine missions. He enrolled, funnily enough, in the Marxist Workers' School in Berlin which is a funny place for the father of you know, hyper-capitalist hedge funds. Uh, and I found and this is a story that repeats itself in your book. A lot of lefties wind up. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, including George Soros, who was a speculator who was anti-speculation. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, I found a document, actually, from the British authorities from the early 1930s uh, back to Washington, to the State Department, saying, this young man, Alfred Winslow Jones, who keeps on coming to England, you know, is he really a Marxist, enrolled in the Marxist work? I mean, how dangerous is this guy? Should we arrest him? Uh, so he was thought to be a left-wing subversive, and although his German wife dumped him, um, and he went back to America and remarried an American woman and said to her, honey, you know, we should go for a honeymoon. I know what, let's go to the front lines of the Civil War in Spain, where, you know, they hung out with Dorothy Parker and Ernest Hemingway gave them a bottle of Scotch whiskey. Anyway, this was the character who set up the first hedge fund. And the tools, to come back to your question, the tools that he used included uh, the, the hedging, which means that you bet on something's going up and something's going down. You bet on it going up by being long, by buying it. You bet on it going down by being short, which means you borrow the stock and sell it. Um, so you're betting both ways. And when you do that, you don't actually mind if the broad market index goes up or down, because you're hedged. And now that you've hedged out that market risk, you can expand the other kind of risk that you're taking, which is a view that, let's say, you're long General Motors and short Ford, because you think General Motors is better managed than Ford. So you're making a specific judgment about the relative quality of the management of these two companies. And you've hedged out the worry about whether auto sales generally will go up. So now that you've taken a very specific risk, you can expand that uh, bet by borrowing extra money, putting it onto that bet without actually making your portfolio risky, because you've taken out so much risk through the hedging. And it's that combination of hedging and leverage which are common to not all, but, but many hedge funds that came later. And you can apply it to fixed income strategies and so forth. Now, the prevailing idea, which you discuss in the book, uh, that uh, these hedge managers are working around and through is the efficient market theory. What does that theory say markets are like, and uh, what do hedge fund managers see that's not true about that theory? Well, the efficient market theory says that uh, markets have efficiently uh, absorbed all the relevant information uh, pertaining to the price of a stock or, or a bond. Uh, so smart people, the idea is, smart people who are investors have already gotten hold of all the information and, and figured it all out. And, and they, if, if, it, if it looks like it's irrationally high, you know, they've sold it and they brought the price down and vice versa. And so it's difficult to beat the market because all the information is already in the price. And if the security moves uh, in the next five seconds, it's because new information has come from somewhere. Uh, and, and, and that's why it's moved. So you can't predict it because by definition, uh, if all the known information, all the existing information is in there, only something that's not predicted can move it. Um, and therefore, that's related to the idea that movements are random. Um, there's no correlation in prices. Just because it went up one day doesn't mean it will go up the next day. And that's basically a summary of the efficient market hypothesis. It became dominant in academic finance from roughly the mid to late 1960s, and it ruled the discipline until the mid to late 1980s, uh, so about 20 years or so. Uh, and hedge funds are interesting because essentially they've made money by finding the qualifications, the kinks, the exceptions in the efficient market hypothesis. And so one early example is that actually the efficient market academics, they stipulated that there could be a few exceptions. For example, if liquidity was imperfect, meaning that if a very big seller of something uh, would move the share price down, uh, not because they're selling because they have a view on the fundamental value of the, of the equity. But it could be, say, you know, an insurance company that had some investments, and now it faces a claim. There's been a hurricane. It has to pay out some money. So it has to sell stock to raise the money. It's an it's a, it's a information-free sale. And this big sale could not price us off their equilibrium for a bit, because liquidity is imperfect. So now along comes uh, this hedge fund manager, Michael Steinhardt, uh, 
who systematically milks that liquidity distortion, the fact that sometimes mm. when big sellers come along, they do move prices. He gets in there and he takes the other side of the trade when the big institution needs to sell a big sh block of shares. Um, and therefore, he gets that discount created by illiquidity and then sells back at the equilibrium price uh, uh, you know, half an hour later. Uh, when, when you go through your history in, in, in each chapter is the colorful story of a new hedge fund manager who emerges or who suddenly becomes very important because he's seen something new that works in the way you just described. So, so what, what I wrote down was that what you're really saying is they make money by anticipating structural changes in politics, economics, and, and even in society, I think. Uh, is that a, a correct assessment? Because what the picture you paint, the, these people are, are really empiricists in a funny kind of way. They, they have their ear to the ground and they see things uh, uh, which generally, which always are places to make money. Yeah, I mean, George Soros used to say, I don't just play the game, I look for changes in the game. Uh, things that were going to cause something to move a lot. Uh, and that's what he was excited by. And so one good example of this was the uh, 1992 uh, European exchange rate crisis, which is kind of a precursor of the recent one we've had in, in Europe. Um, but in those days, there was this thing, the exchange rate mechanism, which linked together the different currencies of Europe, didn't peg them, but put them in a narrow band so they could fluctuate a little bit, but, but not too much. And this was part of the steps to creating a, a European right. monetary union, right? That's right, that's right. And what uh, George Soros and uh, his um, chief portfolio manager, Stan Druckenmiller, figured out was that German unification had put intolerable strain on this system uh, because the Germans had spent a lot of money on absorbing Eastern Europe, uh, creating a danger of inflation. Because of that, German interest rates were very, very high. Uh, and high interest rates in Germany meant that the other members of this exchange rate system had to move their exchange rates up to keep capital in their country. Otherwise, capital would flee to high yielding German bonds. Uh, and as it fled the pound or the lira, the pound or the lira would fall. That would be in Britain or in Italy. Uh, and, um, and it would fall out of the permitted uh, band. So essentially, the Italians and the Brits and so forth had to raise their interest rates because the Germans had. And this happened at a time when they already had recessions, high unemployment. It was politically very painful to do this. Uh, and so what Stan Druckenmiller and George Soros figured out is that this particular game, which had been running for some years, uh, was going to change. And that when it collapsed, when the system collapsed, uh, you know, the lira uh, in Italy and, and sterling in Britain would, would fall out of the band and they would fall a long way because it was kind of a pent up, um, you know, explosive potential for a downward move. And so they bet on that. Um, and they were right about the change in the game. Uh, and they made, you know, Soros famously a billion uh, dollars on his bet against And he Sterling. said that he broke the pound. Was that the, the expression? Uh... That's right. That's right. And in fact, it, it's, a, it's a drama, which I think is fascinating because it has echoes with the Lehman Brothers crisis of 2009, in the sense that the repetitive element here is that hedge fund managers have a different way of thinking about risk. Uh, than policymakers frequently do. And so what happened in the British case in 1992 is that the Bank of England could see that they were going to be attacked by hedge funds uh, if they tried to keep sterling inside this exchange rate band. And the hedge funds would be selling sterling. And so the Bank of England got lots of ammunition. They, they, they got a big pile of money. So they could buy, a, buy the sterling as the hedge fund guys sold it. And on one particular day when sterling was under strain, they bought a heck of a lot. And they, they bought so much that they drove sterling up by one quarter of a percent against the Deutsche Mark, and they thought, wow, we really showed those speculators <laughs> today. But to George Soros and Stan Druckenmiller, this was a joke, because what it showed you was, on the day when the central bank attacks you with maximum ferocity, the most you can lose is one quarter of one percent. Big deal. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they were playing on the other side a game when they were going to win 15 percent or something if Sterling bust out of the exchange rate mechanism. So think about it. It's not just that there's 50% 50, 50 chance of, of, of sterling breaking out or not breaking out. It's that if it does break out, you're going to get a 15% reward. 
And if it doesn't, you might be penalized to the tune of one quarter of one percent. It's the asymmetrical nature of the payout that pulls the hedge fund guys in. And I think that's the same uh, with Lehman Brothers uh, in 2008, where where we go on, and then I'll have a question for you, but then Paulson made a decision about Lehman Brothers. Paulson, of course, had been a trader, but as you point out in the book, he acted in that case like a policymaker. And yes, it's interesting. You know, Paulson had actually been a mergers and acquisitions banker. He'd been a corporate advisor more than a trader, actually, not like Bob Rubin, who was a trader, uh, the other Treasury Secretary who came from Goldman Sachs. Uh, so, of course, you know, jo um, um, Hank Paulson had, had rubbed shoulders with lots of traders at Goldman. He wasn't naive about this. But I think it's a fair characterization of his mindset in that crucial weekend when he let Lehman go down was roughly that he didn't like to uh, bail everybody out. Um, and he understood that when he bailed big institutions out, it created bad incentives for the future. People in Congress had already called him the finance minister of China, uh, which would sting if you were a, you know, a red-blooded capitalist. Um, and so he didn't want to bail them out. And his view was, if he didn't bail them out, there was a 50% chance that the markets would sort of absorb this, OK, things would be flat. And sure, there was a 50% chance that the markets would go down. But he thought to himself, I think, 50-50, that's a fair chance to take. But then I went to see Paul Tudor Jones, this uh, you know, red-blooded uh, hedge fund guy. And I said, well, how did that weekend feel to you? And he said, it's obvious. And it's obvious. If 50% chance is that things are OK, that means it's flat. So if I bet that it will go down, I lose zero. But 50% chance, it's going to fall through the floor. In which case, if I'm betting it's going to go down, I make tons of money. So it's like playing roulette, where you know, if red comes up, they're going to give you a big payout. But if black comes up, you just get your money back with no penalty. Of course you're going to bet on red. Mm -hmm. And because you will bet on red, and because other hedge fund traders will bet on red, the Hank Paulson bet was bound to lose. Uh, in both the case of, of Paulson and going back to the British crisis uh, in which uh, John Majors was the uh, prime minister and he made the crucial decision about what to do with the pound, uh, you're pointing to the fact that uh, the uh, politicians have an entirely different incentive structure than participants in the market under the efficient uh, market uh, theory. So Major was holding out because he wanted to bring in the members of his coalition to agree to the devaluation, and he wasn't going to do it no matter how much money Soros uh, might make. That's right. So on the crucial day, um, there's a very good description of this whole episode from the government standpoint, from the finance minister in Britain at the time, Norman Lamont, uh, who was in charge of the kind of let's keep sterling in the exchange rate band campaign. And he describes, you know, having agreed with the Bank of England that they would intervene very, very heavily uh, the day after the day I just described. You know, they intervened heavily one day, uh, they got it up by a quarter percent. The next day it fell, and then I think that the third day, uh, which was a Wednesday, uh, they came in, having, Sterling having been battered the day before, and they said, right, now we'll really show them, we'll give them all we've got. And he basically, you know, they had both uh, an interest rate uh, hike uh, and a lot of uh, buying of Sterling in the markets to try and drive its value up. And Norman Lamont, when, when, the, when the policy was announced um, and, the, and the buying of Sterling began, he went into his antechamber where there was a, a, a screen showing Sterling's value. And as the interest rate hike was announced, the screen showed Sterling like this, flat. It was like the heart rate uh, <laughs> monitor in the hospital. The patient flat was dead. Line. Flat yeah. line, flat line. Uh, and so he knew on Wednesday morning that the game was up, that they hit them with all the ammunition they had, and just the markets were too big, they were going to overpower them. But to persuade John Major, the prime minister, to authorize Sterling's devaluation, took him until that evening, because John Major needed to convene a meeting with his cabinet colleagues, make sure they kind of put their hands in the blood, that they would come in and discuss what would be the options now, what should we do, should we call the Germans and maybe negotiate for them to change their policy, or perhaps call our other European partners to put pressure on the Germans. And it was just a political exercise to cover John Major's back, because he was worried that the humiliation of Sterling's devaluation would lay him open to a leadership challenge, he might lose his job. And for every hour that he delayed for political reasons, the hedge funds were making more and more money because they were buying sterling 
I mean, selling sterling, and the Bank of England was buying it. And the Bank of England was buying from them at a value that was going to be 15% off once the inevitable crunch came. So people say to me often, you know, you've written this book about hedge funds. You say that hedge funds make money. How can they make money in efficient markets? Well, here's one answer. When you trade against governments that are not in the market to seek profits, but rather there for political reasons, of course you can make profits. So, so what, what we're seeing in your history is over time, using computers, using new kinds of day, uh, data, responding to economic and, and political change and especially structural change. The, the hedge fund managers can move money and you're arguing that they can make the market more efficient because their incentives and their structure make them contrarians, you call them. Yes. So, uh, so that's the plus, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, but over time, uh, the first question that comes to mind, do, because they are in the business of just making money, are they turning the, the market into a big casino? That is, that, that functionally they can be contrarian, but at a certain point as they make bigger and bigger bets, does it become about making a lot of money, which then can lead down the road unintentionally to collapse? Well, I'm not claiming that there's no risk of a collapse. Uh, that's not my thesis. My thesis is there's less risk of a collapse when you've got hedge funds doing this stuff uh, than if you've got other kinds of institutions. Because the big institutions, the too big to fail banks, the too big to fail investment banks, the too big to fail insurance companies like AIG, even the money market mutual funds, which sound anodyne, but actually were key to the financial crisis in end of 2008. You know, all of these institutions have been bailed out at taxpayer expense. And the difference is with hedge funds is that although long-term capital management, uh, a hedge fund which blew up in 1998. And which was uh, run by two Nobel laureates, I guess, or at least they were on the management they were, one. They were on the management team, that's yeah. right. They weren't really running it, yeah. but uh, yeah. But that's right, so th that's the most famous hedge fund blow up. And in that case, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York got worried enough that they kind of convened the meeting at which private bankers agreed to recapitalize the hedge fund. But there's never been government money put in to bail out a hedge fund. And that's a very important distinction. And I think it, it creates better discipline on the hedge fund managers. Also, these guys have their own money in the fund. They have their skin in the game. If they lose money, it's their own money to some degree. Uh, so it's not a guarantee that hedge funds won't do something dumb. Of course they do. Uh, but they are less prone to doing dumb things than the other financial actors. And so I think that since we do need to go back to what I said at the beginning, there will be financial risk. It does need to be housed somewhere. My claim is that it's better housed in hedge funds than in other kinds of institutions that have less good incentives. Now, uh, in the 90s, at the time of the uh, crisis in Mexico and Russia and then in Asia, and I want to talk about the Asian crisis in a minute, uh, Time had a picture on its cover, which we saw a lot of during the collapse of, of uh, Summers, uh, Greenspan, and Rubin, uh, and uh, Masters of the Universe. The they, Committee to Save the World. The Committee to Save the World and so on. But a point that you're making very powerfully in these stories is that these masters, and not just the Americans, uh, uh, the, the committee to save the world were, were losing control over time, that, uh, as we saw in the British crisis and so on. So uh, this is a place where the game becomes problematic if our faith is in governmental policy like, uh, uh, makers at the national or the international level. Uh, wh what do we do with that conundrum? In other words, it, it, is the answer, well, we're still in a capitalist system and, you know, that's the way it is. <laughs> well, you know, you're getting at the sort of the, the hardest question at the heart of all of this, which is, you know, what do you do about finance? How do you regulate it? Um, can you trust in private financial companies to manage risk uh, sensibly? Obviously not, right? That was the message of 2008, 2009. It's disastrous to do so. But at the same time, can you trust in government regulators uh, 
to prevent the uh, private sector from getting it all wrong? Again, obviously not, because we've run that experiment too. Regulators were supposed to be regulating, uh, and they failed. Now, sometimes people say, well, it's because they failed because Alan Greenspan had a libertarian philosophy and he didn't want to do regulation, and so the Fed was asleep at the switch. Well, I mean, you know, what about the SEC? Are you going to make the same claim about the SEC? Because they also failed. And what about the CFTC? They also failed. And what's more, not just in America. I mean, the British regulators had overhauled their system. They had the financial, um, the FSA, the, I forget the, what it stands for, but anyway, that's their kind of SEC in, in Britain. It was thought to be a model regulator, completely failed, completely failed. Uh, and regulators in, in continental Europe, same thing. There's not much libertarianism, I can tell you, in continental Europe, but the regulators totally failed to restrain the risks of their banks. So in other words, there is neither perfect behavior in the markets with private institutions, nor uh, with government regulators. So my, my argument is uh, we need to be a bit more subtle about how we seek salvation here. We can't say either I'm for markets or I'm for regulation. You've got to kind of look for the sweet spot. And I think, you know, hedge funds, where you get the incentives of the private sector guys right, that if they mess up and they lose money, it's their own money. They care about that. Um, that's got to be part of the solution. A pure regulatory response is misguided because we've tried to regulate before and it's just very difficult. There's one, before we talk about the collapse and, and, and your proposals for reform, there's one uh, point that uh, uh, I want to touch, which is in the Asian crisis. Uh, in, uh, we saw in the case of George Soros uh, the kind of the combination of brilliance and ambivalence so that he didn't go out to make all the money he could as these dominoes fell in Asia uh, because he has both, uh, he's, he's both a gambler and a capitalist but also a man who wants to change the world and the behavior of governments. Uh, so it, talk a little about that, because what happens when these charismatic managers uh, embrace, as in the case of Soros, kind of different values yeah. than you would expect? Yeah. Is, that, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I mean, if you're a liberal, you think it's a good thing, but... Uh, Hmm. Well, you know, that, I, this is absolutely fascinating to me. I mean, George Soros is the most gloriously schizophrenic individual. Um, a schizophrenia, I think he, he acknowledges himself, by the way, um, that he has multiple personalities. He's both a philosopher, he takes that very seriously, and a philanthropist come statesman, and a speculator. Uh, so he's got a tripartite uh, personality, uh, and that's the richness of the man. And so the way it comes up in the Asian crisis is that in Thailand, his fund made a billion dollars by betting that the Thai currency uh, would collapse. And in betting, of course, they hastened the collapse. And the Soros team was quite ambivalent about this. I mean, they had debates and sort of late night drinks and they, they, they wrestled with whether this was good for the world or not. And the consensus they came out with was, it's okay to be a speculator betting against the Thai currency because um, Thailand's running fundamental economic policies which are not sustainable. The reason we would bet against the currency is because these guys have a current account deficit uh, and a fixed exchange rate, and those two things can't last for very long. So we're usefully sending a message that the government needs to ch change its policy. That was their, their rationale. Uh, and I actually agree with that. I mean, I think that if you take the Greek sovereign debt crisis recently, for example, if only we had had more hedge funds betting against Greece three years earlier, because then they would have had three less years in which to borrow absurd amounts and get the whole country too much into debt. But uh, if, if you'll let me, I'd love to tell the story about Soros Please. and South Korea, because that is the other side of the coin here. You know, after Soros had made uh, this billion dollars in Thailand, you know, the next thing that happened was that Indonesia um, collapsed and then Malaysia got into trouble with its exchange rate. And then in November of 1997, the Soros economist based in Asia, Rodney Jones, went to South Korea and he was visiting a South Korean finance company, and on the wall of the boardroom, he could see these sort of boastful announcements saying, we organized financing for company XYZ. And company XYZ was a Thai real estate company, which, you know, this guy had spent a lot of time in Thailand during the crisis. He knew these real estate companies, they were all bust. They were not paying any money back. So if the South Korean finance guys had lent money to them, they weren't getting it back. So how come they were still in business?
So he pressed the hosts on this and said, well, so how, how come you're still here? And after some dissembling, the answer was, well, because the central bank has given us money under the table. Uh, and after having the same conversation at four or five different uh, finance companies in South Korea, you know, it was obvious that the central bank had committed a large chunk of its reserve secretly under the table. And therefore, it had no ammunition left to defend the exchange rate. So the exchange rate in South Korea was going to collapse too. So the Soros guy sends a message to headquarters in New York saying, guys, here is the trade. A billion dollars you can make. Just think about it. I mean, he might get 5% of that in his personal bonus at the end of the year. 5% of a billion is 50 million. You can retire on that, I think. So he is very excited. And the answer from New York when he sends this message is radio silence. Nothing. So he's more and more agitated. He sends a second message a couple of days later urging them to do the trade. And the answer is nothing. Radio silence. And then George Soros comes to South Korea, but not to do the trade. He comes to be a philanthropist. There's a red carpet reception at the airport. You know, he's ro he rolls out of the airplane and he says, speculators are bad. Here's how you fend off the bad speculators. I suggest the government does this and this. He went to visit the president in the presidential uh, residence. And he wanted just, he decided that week would be uh, philanthropy week. He didn't want to be a speculator. Hmm. So I always wondered afterwards, you know, if I had been the economist who spotted the trade, how bitter would I have been about not getting that bonus? And I think the answer is I would have been bitter enough that if a writer had come to me 10 years later and said, do you know anything about what went on inside the Soros funds uh, at that crucial time in the Asia crisis? I would have said, I do. And I've got uh, 200 pages of real time notes and I will email them all to you right now. And I'll explain everything you want to know. And this is one of the many lucky breaks I had in terms of getting document dumps from inside hedge funds so I could really tell the story uh, from the inside. Now, uh, uh, I want to move to the 2008 crisis. And uh, one of the uh, uh, issues that a program like this likes to deal with is clarifying for people, you know, who and how things work so we can understand it. And so the bottom line is you're saying here the hedge funds were not responsible for the collapse. Who was? Well, I think they were not responsible for the collapse because actually in 2007 they didn't lose money. They were up by 10% when other people were losing a lot. And in 2008 they did lose money, but they lost half as much as the S&P 500 index went down. So there's the evidence. They managed their risks better than others, and they didn't get a government bailout. They cost taxpayers zero. Furthermore, very importantly, they cost creditors zero because uh, whenever hedge funds get into trouble, they typically get closed down before the investor's money, the equity, is exhausted. Uh, so when it's down by about half, typically it just gets folded. So that means that, that the lenders don't lose anything, which is important in terms of the contagion you get. When lenders take a hit, they tend to pull in loans from elsewhere, uh, and that creates the domino effect of, of contagion in, in the financial system. So hedge funds were, were much better for the system than, than all of the other players. And the other players include, you know, the, first of all, uh, the investment banks, um, which were all out of business by the end of the year, I, either out of business or in the case Merrill, of Morgan Stanley. Uh, well, Lehman. Yes, right. Merrill was bought by Bank of America because it was about to bust, go bust. Uh, Lehman Brothers went bust. Uh, Bear Stearns uh, was about to go bust, so it had a fire sale uh, to JP Morgan. There were two survivors. Uh, were Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, and they survived because the Federal Reserve agreed to give them access to their emergency lending and turn them into bank holding companies, right? So that's the story of the big five investment banks, and they clearly were at the heart of excessive leverage, too much borrowing, too much risk taking, uh, and too much packaging of crazy, complicated securities um, that nobody understood and that greatly exacerbated the trouble. So they're not the only bad actor. I mean, AIG, the insurance company, had a crazy uh, sort of financial engineering group that agreed for some reason to absorb the risk of default on lots of credit securities by um, selling uh, credit default swaps. Uh, and when the music stopped and the, and the, and the subprime market blew up, uh, they were left with so many obligations to pay out on this insurance that they had to be bailed out by the government too. Citigroup, the biggest commercial lender, 
had to be bailed out. All of these small money market funds um, were, it turns out, uh, behaving crazily, buying uh, short-term uh, debt paper from uh, banks that weren't necessarily going to be able to pay them back. Uh, and so they had to be backstopped by the government. The credit rating agencies were not rating credit, they were just earning fees for looking the other way. Um, so there's a long list of bad actors. And my point is that you know, financial regulation is the, is the needed response to all of that, and we've had that in Congress. But as well as looking at the stuff that didn't work and try to fix it with regulation, we need to pivot away and look at the bit that worked relatively well, the hedge funds, and say, how can we get more of the risk into these hedge funds? Because these guys seem to know how to manage it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, help me understand something. It were, was what AIG and Goldman Sachs doing, had they created hedge funds within their organizations, or were those not really, were, were they so, so different that we can't call them hedge funds? Well, that's a good question. I mean, there's a blurry definition of hedge funds. If you put you know, four or five experts in a room, you might get six or seven definitions mm -hmm. of hedge funds. Um, I think that uh, you know, my case in favor of hedge funds is a case in favor of entrepreneurial, freestanding boutiques. It's not a case in favor of wacky trading inside too big to fail institutions you know, that are going to be backed up by the taxpayer. I don't want those guys to be taking crazy risks because I'm underwriting them through my taxes. Uh, so I think you know, what Goldman Sachs uh, does with its prop prop proprietary trading it is probably something that needs to be reined in and is being reined in under the reform. Um, AIG, an appalling case of the regulator backstopping something uh, which shouldn't have been that kind of risk taking, shouldn't be going on in something which is ultimately insured by the government. Um, so you know, I, I think to the extent that I'm saying hedge funds are good, I'm saying freestanding hedge funds are good. We need to move the risk into the smaller entrepreneurial ones and out of the too big to fail ones. But, but there are some elements of hedge fund activity that you want to regulate. You want uh, limits on sort of a red flag or a, an alarm bell in the night if, if leverage is too great, if capital uh, is, is uh, if there isn't enough capital and so on. T talk about what you have in mind. Well, what I have in mind is that you know, if you go back 50 or 60 years and you, and you look at Goldman Sachs then, or Lehman Brothers then, you know, these were small private partnerships managing their partner's own capital uh, on an unregulated basis. They were basically like hedge funds. Um, and they were not systemically problematic because they were too small. They were, they were small enough to fail. Um, but over time, uh, the ones that did well of those partnerships from the 50s and so forth, they grew and grew and grew. And then at a certain point, they issue shares in themselves. And once you take an outside people's money, you're managing somebody else's capital. You're not so careful with it as when you're managing your own capital in a private partnership. So my point at the end of the book is that, you know, we've been here before. Um, private partnerships have morphed into dangerous systemic investment banks. And equally, private uh, hedge fund partnerships will over time probably grow bigger. And although they're not mainly systemically problematic now, they will become big enough to be problematic in the future. We should be ready for that. So we should have a test of when you reach a certain size, um, you should get some questions from the regulator. And when you get to a really big size, uh, then you should be subject to being regulated like an investment bank, because that's pretty much what you've become. Uh, I, I guess uh, after reading your book, uh, I've learned a lot, but I'm not sanguine about the future when we move beyond hedge funds and look at the global economic system. And so if we go back, for example, to the Asian crisis, uh, the aftermath of that was the creation by countries of sovereign funds that are this huge uh, uh, commitment to funds which they then manage. And in, in the case of China, they, although I think their funds, they were doing this before the crisis, but they survived the crisis. Then they began loaning the money. So, so you created this great imbalance mm -hmm. uh, between uh, surplus and deficit countries. Mm -hmm. How are we going to reform problems like that, which are an aftermath of the crisis uh, uh, in the future, because that the aftermath of that crisis, as I understand it, helped create the crisis of uh, 
of uh, That's right. 208. That's right. And in fact, you know, you've just told one example, which I talk about a bit in my book, uh, of a past crisis in which hedge funds were involved. And as you say, the solution to the crisis turned out to create a new problem, namely the problem of global imbalances and a lot of pressure actually just uh, bubbling up in the last week or two uh, around a kind of global competition to manage your mm -hmm. exchange rate. Uh, which I think is very worrying and very destabilizing. Which could lead to a beggar thy neighbor problem. Yeah, as it did in, in the 20s and 30s, exactly. So we have now very good trade rules in the world through the World Trade Organization, which I think so far has managed to prevent trade wars, despite a very big uh, recession. Um, but what we don't have is rules around exchange rate management, and that's where I expect we'll see the most tension. Uh, and that's quite a worrying thing for the next few years. But you know, there are other examples in my book, too. Uh, of past crises, which were kind of dry runs for the 2007-2008 crisis. And one is in 1994, uh, when the Federal Reserve raised interest rates at the beginning of the year, and was shocked to find mm -hmm. that the raising of interest rates caused a massive dumping of bonds by the hedge funds, another sort of shadow finance, shadow banking system, um, that had stocked up on tons of, uh, they basically used short-term low rates to borrow lots of money cheaply, and then they bought lots of bonds. And when the low rates were raised by the Fed, they dumped all these bonds. And so uh, bond markets went into a spiral downwards. Um, there was a global sell-off. Uh, various small hedge funds from the time blew up. Um, in fact, one of them was called Askin Capital. It was doing weird credit uh, mortgage securities, in fact, mm. uh, in shades of 2008. Uh, Michael Steinhardt, who we mentioned earlier, was down 30%. Bill Clinton was on holiday in California. He got interrupted. Uh, he had to go out and talk to the press about what the heck was going on in bond markets. Um, so, so we've been through these dry runs. And the policy consensus, after thinking carefully about what we should do, is that there were no good answers. That was the view after 94. That was the view again after Russia defaulted in 1998. And so uh, people had thought about this before and found that there were no good solutions. And so we should be skeptical about the solutions that we've now put into place following the 2007-2008 crisis. Because intellectually, they're not very different to the ones that were not implemented before. Uh, and for some reasonable arguments, they were not implemented. So I guess the bottom line is, you know, the history, which I tell in the book, I think does support your skepticism about the future. And, and what about the big problems that are out there? The, looking at the United States, the increasing inequality the extent to which that uh, investment is not being made in, in productive uh, enterprises that kind of point to, to new issues like the environment. Uh, uh, the whole problem, uh, what, what I, th these are not the focus of your book, but uh, when we, we leave your book with a sigh of relief about hedge funds and uh, we, we are still left with a lot of these consequences, money slushing around for campaigns, increasing inequality. So it, it, the, what I'm trying to say is the system can't right itself. And although hedge funds may be doing a, a, a positive function uh, in markets and with markets, they're not addressing these problems. Do you, you, you want to offer us a sense of how this might all come together in the future in a way that would give us reform. And ironically, you're saying that, that, the, that in a way, the, the best policemen were the hedge funds uh, uh, in the lead up to the 2008 crisis. Yeah, I mean, on the policeman point, I think it's important to remember that um, to be a contrarian, to bet that the subprime bubble is crazy, you don't just have to be a maverick. Right. I mean, you know, some people think all these hedge fund guys are a bit wacky. You know, the Michael Lewis book is a fantastic piece of uh, storytelling and has a lot of truth in it. Uh, but there's more to the truth than that. In other words, it's not just that you have eccentric people doing this stuff. It's that actually, if you go and speak to John Paulson, who was the by far the most important hedge fund guy who made this anti subprime bubble bet, if you actually look at him, he's not remotely eccentric. He's a very doer sort of, you know, numbers driven guy. Um, and, and, and the important thing he did was not to be eccentric, but to do research, to invest, in fact, $2 million on buying the most detailed set of, of statistics on historical house price behavior, warehousing the statistics in an outside computer company because he didn't have the data storage capacity in-house, 
hiring new analysts to look at these data to figure out what the past told you about the future. So you had to do serious work over a period of months, spending $2 million on it, to come up with the conviction that you were going to bet against this bubble and thereby, of course, reduce the size of the bubble. Um, so I think, you know, that's my point on being the policeman, that, that you need hedge funds with the right incentives to go and do the hard work of becoming contrarian. But, you know, you also raised the important issue about social inequality, and I want to talk about that too, which is, I mean, I make a distinction between my support for hedge fund trading as a healthy thing in markets and the amount of money that hedge fund managers end up going home with. I mean, I call my book More Money Than God for a reason. Uh, there are ungodly sums of money being made. Uh, when J.P. Morgan, the famous banker, died in 1913, he was known as Jupiter for his godlike power over Wall Street. Uh, and his total fortune in today's dollars was 1.4 billion. Some of the people in my book make 1.4 billion in one year, right? Mm -hmm. So they made more money than Jupiter, i.e. more money than God, in a single year. Now, this is just disproportionate. So I think we should tax hedge fund managers' profits a lot more. There's a tax dodge they have, uh, whereby they claim that their income is really a capital gain and they should be taxed at the lower capital gains rate. I think we should get rid of that loophole. Uh, so I'm deeply in favor of hedge funds as risk managers. I'm not saying that we should just tolerate the uh, amount of money they take home. What, what, what do you think should be the driver of uh, capital investment that's productive generally for the society because in the end, you know, you have uh, uh, capital doing not a good job, hedge funds pointing in a contrary direction, but it doesn't necessarily lead to the kind of productive investment that, that we want to make. And the picture that emerges is one in which we can't trust the government regulators uh, and maybe the politicians to actually build coalitions that will push the country in the right direction so the capitalists are, are investing in the right places? Well, I guess, yeah, I don't have much faith in the government uh, to start directing capital and picking, you know, which sectors of the economy should get it. I think, um, you know, private individuals who are paid to get that thing right and make money if they get it right are more likely to just do the sheer work and deploy the resources you need to deploy to get that difficult capital allocation thing right. And you know, venture capitalists in California, uh, you know, are everybody's favorite example. Um, you know, they have done a good job of supporting Silicon Valley startups, and that's been great uh, for the economy. So, you know, maybe the next wave comes with alternative energy, with biotech. A lot of the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, the venture capitalists, have moved in that direction. So I think we shouldn't be too pessimistic. You know, I think the, the private capital markets do get some stuff right uh, and certainly would be better than, than government-directed money. Would, would hedge funds play a role here at all? Or? They do play a role, but it's an, in, a sort of, it's a, it's an indirect and subtle one. And, and the role is basically that for the venture capitalists to, to put money in a startup or in a youngish company, they need an exit. They need to be able to think to themselves in five to six years' time, we can do an IPO and list this on a, on a, on a tradable market. Um, otherwise, they won't do it in the first place. So they depend on the tradable market. The tradable market, in turn, depends on there being traders who trade in it. If it's not a liquid market with lots of stuff going on, lots of action, that market won't be attractive to list stocks. So by trading actively and often in a short-term way in public markets, uh, the hedge funds actually do encourage private capital formation by venture capitalists. One final ca question. What would you like uh, audiences, the, the lay public, to be left with? Because uh, they're going to go out and read your book, and there's a lot in the book. Uh, so what, uh, is there one central idea that, or conclusion that you've come to? I suppose the thing that, uh, in the end, that sticks with me uh, is less a policy conclusion and just a sense that you know, to be a hedge fund manager, you have to think to yourself that you're smarter than the market consensus, that the weighted average of lots of people's opinion expressed in today's price is wrong, that you're smarter than that. And to have that belief, you've got to be a very self-confident uh, individual. And so this sector has attracted over the years, larger than life figures, some of them have come from 
physics, from computer, from, from code breaking, from computer science. Others have come from sort of philosophy. Others have been very good kind of charismatic leaders of men who have gone off and, you know, hustled their way into understanding more about which corporation is well managed than the other one. Um, so there's a variety of people and lots of different hedge fund styles. And it's the fascination of how each of them in their different way have beaten the market. Uh, that's the thing that endures with me as I think about my book. Well, Sebastian, on that note, I want to thank you for taking the time to come to Berkeley and be on our program. Let me show your book again. Uh, and there was a limit to what we could cover here, but uh, uh, I think we've pointed uh, your potential readers to go out and buy it. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.